It's been a long time since I sat at this wheel and did some throwing. Um, it's born at westcottbellpottery.ca in Nova Scotia, Canada. It's been Christmas! So, um, busy, busy retail shop, um, getting a lot of interruptions. Um, and so, uh, so I've been posting a lot of videos of kiln unloadings because I had lots of time to do that part of it. But uh, anyway, it's going to be a dinner set. And I've got to make a black dinner set. It's a Christmas present, um, which I've already thrown some of the pieces for the dinner set. And now I'm going to throw some place settings, different colors to kind of complement this body of work for the kiln firing and everything. So, um, so I'm going to give you the recipe for the black glaze. Uh, I have licorice already, but I, the person wants a matte black glaze, so I had to find one uh, off uh, glazy.org. Um, so, uh, so I'll show you that, and then I'm going to show you how I'm going to make this dinner set. Um, so first, I weighed my clay. I don't usually do that. Uh, I do everything by eye, but um, but basically this time. I'm weighing my clay so I can get it right, because um, obviously a dinner set needs to be a little. So here you go, here's all my clay. Um, what I'm going to do is throw six mugs, six bowls, six side plates, and six large plates. Um, one pound balls of clay for mugs, one pound two ounces for bowls, because uh, I want them to be able to be used for like a small salad bowl or a dessert bowl, so a little bigger than a regular dessert or soup bowl. And then the side plates are actually one and a half pounds, um, and the large plates are two pounds, 12 ounces. Um, so what I will get with that is while I'm throwing here, I'll get a 12 inch wide plate with the large plates, uh, two pound, 12 ounces, and I will get a eight inch plate, uh, and I'll throw it about nine and a half now, but it'll end up about eight inch plate for the side plate and then the mugs and the balls. Okay, so my setup for doing dinner sets is that I throw them to the size of the bat. Um, so this is a, a little bat that I've actually got about 25, 30 of these. Um, so whenever I do anything that's got to be a specific size, I just use a bat because that tells me I don't have to use calipers. I know it's the size because it's... This um, was a regular 16 inch bat. I think it's 14 inches actually. I can throw 16 inch platters on this just over. Uh, but anyway, it's a and I cut a hole out the size of this and so all I have to do with a little piece of foam here to make it a bit a bit tighter I wedge this in bang it down and it'll pop right out with a screwdriver I keep it right here on the wheel um, and so I just throw it to the size pop it out throw another one in throw it out and, you know and so on um, so there we go this is the side plate which is a pound and a half Okay, so pushing your hand in from the left there, I've got my left little finger right on the bat, so it burns a little bit if you press too hard, but it's there to stop the clay from getting pushed underneath my little finger. And then the top hand is basically just pancaking this thing out with my little finger pushing back so that we don't end up with a, like a mushroom at the edge. Um, and it, it really kind of pushed some pressure into that little rim there that you see. Um, and, and so I don't get um, like that little overhang that you'll often see when you're pulling out where the clay has gone further and you've got your finger pushed underneath a bit and it's called a mushrooming thing. Um, so then I'm just now compressing that rim, getting it kind of um, taller, um, putting a little compression with my finger on the top edge as well um, so that you know it's, you can see how it widened a little bit. Um, so you really, after stretching it so thin and then you're compressing that edge, you're really putting a little bit of kind of density in the clay there. So and now it's literally just a matter of fingers pushing together um, to pull the rim up. And as you can see, I've got my little sponge edge right on the top to stop it from thinning too much. Because the last thing you want to do is have somebody get a big dinner set and then they chip one of the plates. So I make sure that rim is rounded. Um, it's very important, I think, that, that that has a little compression back down.
Okay, so what I'm doing is first you have to you know, make sure this is moist uh, and so it's not wet and it's not dry and then this is rounded so it doesn't trap any air underneath. Bank it down and then you have to center it obviously which is a matter of resting your arms completely on the side of the wheel so you're stable and your thigh should be tucked around the wheel too, left and right, so you're really solidly in them, right up against that wheel. And then you center it. Centering, I've got lots of beginner videos for you to learn how to do that. Um, but basically I bring my top hand in, then my side hand, and I just move them around like that. But I do it very fast, this is slow motion. And that way you can feel for the center when it stops wobbling. You've got to completely surround the ball with play. Once it's not wobbling, you actually press down like pancake till it gets feels a bit dry, then you let go slowly. Do it again, press down till it feels a little bit dry, then you let go slowly. Don't let it drag on your hands. And you're trying to push the clay out to the size of the bat. Like that. And then you take a rib, the rubber rib and you simply smooth the bottom. And you've noticed that I've actually, I'm putting a tall vertical rim rather than a flat, flared out rim. That's a customer request. And then I'm simply bringing it up about an inch, not even an inch. It, the, the total height will be one inch when it's finished. And round it a little bit because you don't want it to chip easily. I made some of those wobbly rim plates and uh, two of them are my dinner set chipped so I'm making my rims a little fatter since that. Alright, and that's how to throw one of those size plates. So now I have six of these. No I don't, I have five. I've got to make one more. So, two pounds, 12 ounces. Okay, so two pounds, 12 ounces, I've learned from experience, I can get a plate the size of this bat, which is a 12 inch bat. Um, so it's actually 11 inches and seven eighths, but just under 12. So it's just, you know, I, I now have to do exactly what I did to the smaller plate, but I've got to do it with a lot more pressure, obviously. But it's really important that that left little finger stays connected to the bottom of the outside wall so it keeps that under compression and you don't end up with a lack of compression for a star, which can cause cracks, but also it stops it mushrooming. But look, just goes right to the very edge. And I'd stop before I run my little finger off the edge there, but then smoothing out the center. Now here you could put some throwing rings if you really want to make like a spiral in the center, which I like um, and I often do it, but this man wants just a smooth flat plate. It's, a, it's going to have a very contemporary feel to this dinner set. Um, and, and of course now you're just kind of compressing a little bit. Uh, I don't want to take it too tall. And, uh, I think that the dimensions are supposed to be one inch from the outer edge um, and of course here now you see my huge issue. <laughs> this was funny because I, I could feel that going all the way around. Uh, I thought it was just an air bubble at first and then when it caught me a little sharp I thought, oh no, this is, this is definitely a screw. What's a screw doing through my pug mill? Anyway, somehow that got into my clay. So now you see me not wanting to waste any bit of clay at all. I just took a little tiny lump of clay and there's a hole there so I just pushed the clay in. Uh, there was no surface water there so I know that it's clay on clay without water in between. And now I just put some compression back onto it. So basically uh, if you just you take a screw out you put the same volume of clay back in and then you let it rotate with under pressure several turns and you can actually make it like nothing happened. Um, and so, you know, that was not expected.
now I gotta throw the mugs. Okay, centering the clay as normal, little finger on the left hand is pushing in right at the base of the bat there. You can see why it's so white because my finger's pushing on and then pulling up. Make sure that you've got a, more pressure on your outside finger um, to stop it flaring out too much. Um, drying it out. And then the metal rib is to get all that water off so you don't actually get it softening down even more after you take it off the wheel. And I just shaped the foot a little bit there. And then just drag it off the wheel. Ta-da! <laughs> okay, the important thing here is my left little finger is pressing hard to stop mushrooming. And then when I open it up here, I work the center. I push in several times there to compress that center. And then when I open it up, my right hand is pressing really hard to actually stop it flaring out too much, even though the left hand can flare it out. That was a very simple shaped coffee mug. So now I'm gonna do a very simple shaped bowl to match. Wider and shorter, I think. This clay is a little bit more than the coffee bug clay, but only two ounces, I think it was. Okay, now I'm centering one pound, two ounces, which is more than the coffee mug by two ounces, but it's the same process as I did with the coffee mug. I worked the center there to make sure there's no S cracks, and then I'm doing the pull, and my left hand is pushing out but the right hand pushes back enough so it doesn't flare too much. It's easier to control a narrower form. And now we want to get some belly to this, so we're pushing out with the left hand. And the right hand is still putting pressure back because we don't want it just to flare out and make a big floppy shaped ball. Um, the water gets it softer, so we've got to get that out as fast as possible. And near the metal rib is actually shaping as well as dragging the water off on the outside. And I curve the ball back in just to touch at the top, so when you use a spoon, you don't spoon liquid out of the ball, it falls back into the spoon as the spoon comes to the top of the ball. And then I obviously put a little spiral in there. That's cute. Okay, so basically, centering the clay is the most important thing you can do with anything. And, and these pieces, we don't want them to get too wide because it's a ball with a curved in at the top. Um, so when I pull up here, my outer right hand is actually pushing back quite a bit. And press that rim down a little bit as you get to the top. Don't let your rim get really thin. It's uh, easy to chip a ball uh, or any piece of pottery. So see my forefinger there, press right down on the rim. And of course that water in the center needs to be got out as fast as possible because the, the piece softens down as soon as you, you know, had put water in there, it's absorbed into the clay. So we're trying to get it out as fast as possible. The metal rib does the outside, but the inside it's a little harder, so I just use a sponge to get that out. And there you go with that spiral again, keeps getting in there. I also turn everything upside down. I just did the mugs, so the bowls were all thrown last night, so they've uh, been in a damp cupboard all night, so they don't dry out too much. And then I basically cut through them, turn them upside down, so that the rim doesn't dry too much before I trim them, which if the rim dries out, there's a tendency to crack the rim when you're trimming with the pressure of a giffing grip or the bits of clay that you put there to hold the ball down on the wheel. Oh, this hop, I've told you about it before, use it many times a day. You can make those just with rebar and a guitar string. It's 
so these will sit till tomorrow when I will trim them. Okay, just have to put some handles on these mugs. I don't usually have six to a bat, usually I'll do four or five, but six seems to work on this shape quite easily. So, so like I've said before, if the bugs are bendable and the handles are freshly pulled, in other words, you can bend this like that, um, and it leaves a fingerprint a little bit, the clay comes off on your finger, then you know it's soft enough so you can actually just push your handles on there. Yeah. <coughs> Oops, I got the radio on. There you go. And then um, what I do is just squish down the handle, place it in the location it has to go, move it up and down, side to side. So you see I didn't do any scoring. I've been doing this for 40 years, so nobody shouted at me for the handle falling off. So we know it works. And then you bend it. This is recycled clay, as you saw from the video, because I actually <laughs> I had a screw inside my clay. And then it's actually working really good. That new pug mill I bought exactly one year ago, and it's working great. And then I always wedge a little bit extra down in that little part down in the bottom there. So the same on all the pieces. So I just rub water, you know, with a paintbrush over the area where the handle's going to go on each mug twice, going all the way around, but no scoring. And then I know that the handle will stick because the slip created by the water and the rubbing with some pressure for the handle makes it stick. So that little extra that comes out just goes right in the center there just to give the extra thickness for that. If I was doing slip work on these pieces, I also do some at the top, but I don't intend putting slip on these. So I just need it at the bottom just to give an extra thickness to there. And if you pulled your handles in a specific way, maybe you could get that thickness at the bottom of the handle, but it just takes me no time to add it. Letting gravity join, you know, pull the handle to the right angle. Got lots of company with the birds today, but the windows are closed. It's a little windy today, as you can see. It's a nice day, though. It's a too windy. Lots of pigeons here. We've got a big storm coming tomorrow, coming up the coast from Florida to New York, Mid Atlantic states, and then it's heading up to us. So we're supposed to get 100 kilometer wind and three to four inches of rain. Not very Christmassy. We had one last week and the week before, so it's like a, a weekly big nor'easter storm. When you're applying handles like this, you have to make sure that the mug is movable so you can bend it easily and it leaves a fingerprint if you actually put pressure on. Um, so uh, it's um, no scoring needed at all, just a little bit of moisture to help the clay absorb and then basically just kind of a little bit of clay in the bottom of the handle there in where the join is just to give it a little extra thickness at that yeah. point. And then I take this tool and I push that extra piece of clay in, backwards and forwards, dip it in water, don't want any water to dribble between the clay bit and then the handle, so just do that. Sometimes they go in really easy, and other times you have to work at it a bit. And then I start to work on the top part. Like I said, if I was putting slips on these, I would dab a little ball of clay on there and, and smudge it in to make the top join a little thicker. Just because when you use slip, the piece gets wet and softer. Um, and so you need an extra piece of clay with a join of the handle to stop the handle from falling off. But these are not going to be slipped.
Okay, when you're actually smudging these pieces in with the, I use the back of my paintbrush, you can use a wooden modeling tool if you want. You just have to make sure that you just kind of really work it in so that there's no gaps or any little crack areas showing up. Remember, this is really soft clay, so it's easy to push. You know, I have, I have a little bit of water on the back of my paintbrush there, and then I use the regular paintbrush end to actually smooth everything in. So really working any bits of sharp clay down um, so you're really kind of making that handle feel nice to the touch. You don't want to leave anything sharp. And it's a good time at this point to actually make sure that the handle is in a good kind of shape too. You don't want it to, you know, look like it's sagging off. I and mean, then I've got nice thick areas at the top and the bottom of my handle, so it looks substantial. Um, but it's not overpoweringly heavy either, so you want to make sure that it's in proportion to your mug. Um, and it's just a matter of giving yourself a little bit of extra time here to make that handle look nice. I mean, just don't give up on it and leave a saggy handle. And now I use my little balls of clay. The home for the thumb. Ball, if you place in there. It's a gorgeous day out today. A little windy and quite chilly because it's uh, only about five degrees, but the wind is a little cold because it's coming out of the north. Tomorrow it's going to come from the south, so it's going to warm up. I should show you as soon as I've done this, I'll show what it's like. There you go, little spiral. Home for the thumb. And now there'll just be a little shaping of these, just in case I dent the rim by doing this. It's good to dip that in, put some dust on it before you press it in, and it doesn't stick. Okay, we've got six mugs. Six sort of teacups, almost. But, uh, and I usually end up just, you know, marking the rim a little bit by handling, so it's good just to take your brush and just put that around. This mug's a nice shape because I don't have to use a paintbrush to hold the bottom as I'm pushing in it and get my hands in there. Alright, so that's that. I also turn everything upside down. I just did the mugs, so the bowls. These were all thrown last night, so they've uh, been in a damp cupboard all night so they don't dry out too much. And then I basically cut through them. Turn them upside down so that the rim doesn't dry too much before I trim them, which if the rim dries out, there's a tendency to crack the rim when you're trimming with the pressure of a giffing grip or the bits of clay that you put there to hold the ball down. Okay, this is a harp that I use many times a day. Uh, I got it in England. It's basically a very useful tool, it's, but you can make one using rebar bent twice and then put a guitar string around the two ends and pull tight and you've got yourself a harp. I'm sure a local blacksmith could make one for you. Okay, now I'm just fluting these before I trim them. They're a little soft for doing this, but this is that potato peeler that I use for fluting. And because they're a little soft, the, the fluted bit doesn't fall out. But we're going to get some power outs by the sound of it. We have a big storm coming up the coast and they're warning everybody to get their water in the bathtubs. The 110 kilometer winds, which is about 70 mile an hour. So. The bowls are a little different because I actually trim um, that section there usually and I've recently been doing chattering on almost everything um, so it's just the upper part that I really need to just pull it and I'm just going to try doing these and maybe get a bit lower on this at least it's not denting the rim. 
This is a little drier, so at least I don't have to clean that tool out as much. thing before I fluted. When I trim it that will actually get leveled up. That's not bad. Yeah, it works good. Okay, so we figured it out. Okay, trimming the plates is actually pretty straightforward and easy. If you have a giffing grip, it's just even simpler. I'll show you in a minute how to do it with just lumps of clay, but um, these things are kind of expensive. They weren't bad when I bought my first one of these, but anyway. Um, I simply take off a little bit and give myself a little groove right there. It's two functions to actually help me have, hold the plate upside down if I need to do some dipping with the plate upside down. Um, it just make, it, It's an elegant kind of solution to the bottom of the plate. Just gives you a little edge that frames it off the tabletop. And then I take this round rib, and if I feel anything, I maybe go do that two, maybe three times. But if it's a simple scrape and you don't feel any bumps or anything, that's it. And then I take my rock pebble from the beach and I will smooth over the entire back, careful in the middle. And that just makes it so it doesn't scratch the surface of the table. Most people use a tablecloth obviously, but um, it gives you a polished surface on the bottom. So that's pretty straightforward. The inside, these are going to have a rim, which is not glazed, so I'm just going to do that there as well. It'll just smooth that edge a little bit. I don't think it really matters too much on the rim because the clay is fairly smooth anyway, but, but it'll help. And you know the drill when it comes to trimming if you don't have a giffing grip. Let's try again with a different marker. This is a newer one. Look at that. Okay, so it must be the marker. So you can actually make it easier to center something just by putting some rings on a bat and keeping that bat just for trimming. Uh, and it actually um, wears off after a while, but you can just put it back on. So. Um, then you turn your wheel, your plate, back upside down. Wow, looks like they've got that one mark just in the right place. Maybe you could just do them a little closer, because I got lucky there. That's pretty it. And what rubs the marks off, of course, is sticking your clay down. And then it lifts up the ink. It doesn't take long to put it back. And then just make sure those are firmly placed down, but don't press them into the pot, you'll crack the rim. And then take a trimming tool, and you just do the same again. Sometimes I do this with the clay lumps just because the, the giffing grip has those big plastic things at the edge, and sometimes you just can't get to the edge because of the, 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 the fixtures that hold the, the, the uh, giffing grip piece in. And other times you can just wet the rim and press it down, but you know that that's a little bit risky. I can do it, but you know I have had pieces release a little bit. That's when you wet the rim and it acts like a suction and just sticks the piece to the the, you know, the plastic surface. Anyway, you got that smooth. Use the rock again. You can use the back of a spoon too. This rock is 
10, 12 years old doing this now, so it's getting nice and polished. And, what I should show you is, I made these so that they sit rim to rim. And that wasn't measured with calipers, that was because of the bat size that I threw them on. So that's why I say my plates, I try to make them to the bat size, because then I don't have to use calipers, I just throw them literally to the bat. Uh, these were a little different, the first time I made these plates like this really. Uh, did them once before years ago, but uh, basically I don't do a piece with a vertical rim like this. I'm, I'm going to make six place settings here and see whether it is popular. Okay, <laughs> I mean a happy mood. Uh, I went to bed last night thinking, oh, that dinner set's fired today. And um, I raised the firing temperature by six degrees Fahrenheit. And because I felt like the black needed a little bit extra maturing and uh, and then I thought when I was going to sleep last night, oh, I wonder if that would just ruin everything. And you never know in clay because it does actually, the slight changes can actually make something not very good. But this time it worked. <laughs> so here we go. This is the black dinner set, um, which is a special order. And, um, and it looks like things are good here. <laughs> so we'll see when I lift them up. This was the only thing I think isn't black in here. Um, and it's actually... Very nice. It was a refire T-ball. There was a little something on the bottom. Oh, there it was, a little something on the bottom that the stilt had collapsed. And I just glazed over it, fired it again, and it made it even nicer. So that's a beautiful little T-ball. So, this was the test piece I did for the man um, to actually um, show what the black would look like. Uh, and uh, I refired it because it was not glazed to there. Um, and I thought it would look nicer since he wanted a black uh, uh, natural clay rim on all the balls, but I'd already glazed the top, so it couldn't do that. But I glazed the bottom and it looks really good. So the texture from the chattering tools really shows up. Nice. And that black is on very thin at that location because this was glazed over vitreous clay for the second part firing. Um, this was over bisque, but that part was vitreous and it still looks black, but it shows the texture. So that means this glaze can be used really thin or thick. Pieces that, how he wanted it. The black foot, uh, natural clay foot and the natural clay edge with the black glaze everywhere else. Looks really good. It's a matte glaze, but it has a slight sheen to it. <coughs> and I can see what he means. That looks really classy. Very nice. So bowl, small plate, and that glaze is quite matte in the center there. Still feels like a sheen, so that's good. And then the bottom and the edge. Very nice. So it worked. Uh, I did sleep well last night after all that as well. So um, I woke, I guess I was going to sleep. I was thinking I might have ruined the whole thing, but that's just a natural state of mind being potters. I go to bed every night thinking, did I close the lid of the kiln? <laughs> and I, I sometimes come back down here at one in the morning just to check that. Okay, so all the dinner set in this kiln is just like that. So I don't need to show you the entire kiln, but it's, uh, I can show you the next layer just to show how I think it was fired. I think it's all balls on the next layer. Nope, it's a mixture. So you can see it, you know, I was trying to get plates and then balls on a separate layer, but um, I couldn't quite get enough plates on uh, each layer. So I mixed up, I guess, but um, all of them are like this. Looks like we have a really nice looking dinner set. I'll take a picture next so you can see it in a, in a professional looking photo. But it's really nice because the texture shows up. Usually transparent glazes look best with chattering, but this is very subtle, but it looks really nice. The deeper the chattering, the matte glaze, which is opaque, will look nice, I guess. Uh, 
just every layer is very much the same. Um, all right, so um, I hope you like this video. Uh, it's uh, the recipes in there. You can make this yourself. Um, uh, and uh, naturally, I have just thrown, as you saw in this video, more plates. These were done before the ones I just showed in the video. Uh, so I'm going to um, glaze all of those different colors. So I'll have six place settings all in different colors to put in the gallery, just like I'm doing here. We're basically showing that I can make the dinner sets like this in different colors. We'll see if it develops into any orders next year. It's just gambling. <laughs> Thanks for joining me and um, don't forget subscribe. And uh, I'll keep trying to post videos every, uh, every week. It's getting kind of hard to think of all the subject matter. I added 10% black mason stain 6600 to this recipe. The slower you cool the kiln, the more matte the glaze will go, so a slow cool is preferable.